Good morning, everyone. And welcome to the Mental Health Services Oversight and Accountability Commission. My name is Mara Meeting. My name is Mara Madrigal Weiss, and I am the chair of the commission. I want to thank you for attending today's meeting. At our January 25th commission meeting, we approved the commission's strategic plan for 2024 through 2027. Cody, can you please bring up the strategic goal slide? Thank you, Cody. This slide reflects the Commission's goals as outlined in its strategic plan, which continues our commitment to advancing the vision of well being for all Californians. This morning, we will hear from our partners at the Department of Healthcare Services on their vision for early intervention and FSPs. This afternoon, we will hear a report on the Mental Health Student Services Act. And the report that we recently that we recently produced. So we're very much looking forward to that. These topics align with our strategic plan goals to champion vision into action and relentlessly drive expectations. You'll also notice that many of the agenda items have icons next to the titles. These icons represent the strategic plan goals associated with each agenda item. Thank you, Cody. Now we will take roll and establish a quorum. We would like to take we would like to note for the record that we currently have a quorum of eight commissioners in person. That is how we would establish quorum. We have one vacancy on the commission and one commissioner currently on leave. Therefore, under Bagley Keene Open Meetings Act, eight commissioners in person are needed to conduct business today. Also, under the Bagley Keene Open Meetings Act, any commissioners who are participating remotely will be asked during roll call to disclose if they have any other adults in the room over the age of 18 and the nature of their relationship with these individuals. So at this time, I'm going to ask Sandra to please take roll. Commissioners, please unmute your lines now for roll call. If you're participating remotely, I will ask you if there's anyone over the age of 18 in the room with you per Bagley Keene. Additionally, you must remain on camera if participating remotely. If you do not, if you need to step away or go off camera, please let us know. Bontrager. Brown. Here. Bunch. Here. Carnivale. Here. Carrillo. Chambers. Chen. Cortese. Gordon. Here. Mitchell. Robinson. Present. Roulette. Here. Sai. Alvarez. Here. Madrigal Weiss. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you, Sandra. We are now moving to agenda item two, announcements and updates. I would like to start this month's announcements by sharing that October is Mental Health Awareness Month, a month dedicated to raising awareness and understanding of mental health conditions with an aim to reduce stigma and promote public education around mental health. October 10th was Mental Health Day. This year, the World Health Organization announced the theme for World Mental Health Day, Workplace Mental Health, focusing on the importance of mental health and well-being in professional settings. The 2024 legislation session concluded on September 30th, and I'm happy to report that Governor Newsom signed three bills supported by the commission. Assembly Bill 2711 by Assembly Member Ramos regarding a public health approach to suspensions, Senate Bill 1318 by Senator Wahab regarding crisis interventions in schools, and Assembly Bill 1281 by Assembly Member Lowenthal, which will require the Commission to consult with Department of Public Health on statewide strategy to address mental health risks associated with the use of social media by children and youth. We look forward to working with the Department of Public Health on this important report that will be due at the end of 2026. We anticipate having a presentation and discussion on legislative priorities for 2025 at our January meeting. If you have any questions about these bills or legislative cycle, please reach out to Kendra Zoller, our legislative deputy director. Next, I have an update on the Innovation Partnership Fund, Proposition 1. The Behavioral Health Services Act established the Innovation Partnership Fund and directs the OAC to administer that fund. 
The Commission has contracted with University of Pacific to engage community partners and develop a strategic and operational plan for the Innovation Partnership Fund. The first deliverable of this contract is a white paper outlining the opportunity, vision, potential roles, and challenges to be explored. A draft of the white paper is in your materials. We will have UOP presenting to the Commission at our January 2025 meeting. In the meanwhile, if you have any feedback on this white paper or the Innovation Partnership Fund as a whole, please email innovation at mhsoac.ca.gov. Earlier this week, the CLCC com committee met. At this time, I would like to invite Vice Chair Alvarez to share more about what the committee discussed. Uh, thank you, Chair Madrigal Weiss. On Wednesday, October 16th, the Cultural and Linguistic Competency Committee met and had a substantive open format discussion about how the commission can better reach marginalized communities and populations, and in particular, what role or roles the CLCC and other committees can play in supporting the commission's strategic plan around reaching our diverse communities across the state. Uh, we, we focused our conversation on two overarching topics. The first was community-defined evidence practices, especially given how different communities def are uplifting the importance of allowing diverse communities to really define what works best for them in uh, accessing mental health services and support, and uh, even discussion around the definition of what good mental health looks like for various populations. We referenced the comprehensive CRDP report that the commission delved deeper into when we met last year in Santa Barbara, and both community members and the public commented that they would like to see the commission really lift up CDEPs and are excited to see that DHCS has been uplifting these CDEPs as part of the Children and Youth Behavioral Health Initiative, as well as a number of other efforts that um, the department is leading in, in, in promoting mental health. With the prominent inclusion of CDEPs as part of Proposition 1, we discussed the opportunity for the commission to really serve as a champion for putting forward CDEPs that have demonstrated these positive outcomes really thinking about how we can contribute to the literature around CDEPs, how we can continue to change the narrative around the value of CDEPs, and then hide, obviously highlighting lessons learned for counties to really build on what works across the state. We then transitioned to a presentation from commission staff, Tom Orock and Lester Robancho about upcoming RFPs. This is another opportunity where we see direct influence and impact by the committee in the work that the commission does. In particular, it was around uh, this uh, idea of informing and supporting those RFPs uh, on the front end, informing the development RFP of the RFPs, bringing their lived experience as committee members to influence what goes into an RFP, and then on the back end to promote the RFPs so that we have new applicants and folks that are in the community re um, taking advantage of these impre incredible opportunities that the commission offers to support our communities on the ground. In addition to discussing CDEPs, which was also part of the RFP conversation, the group really delved deeper into this conversation around building trust between counties and community organizations and how it's oftentimes these RFPs that provide these unique resources to community organizations to get connected to counties. Um, so it was, it, was a, it was a promising conversation about what can be done as we move forward with Prop 1 implementation, as we move forward with our strategic plan to think through um, our committee structure and how we can um, strengthen it for the future. Our next CLCC meeting will take place on December 11th from 3 to 5 p.m. And we'll use that time to continue to identify effective programs that reach marginalized communities, but we'll also have a specific discussion about adding new members to the CLCC in the coming months, um, as was alluded to uh, in previous um, discussions with the commission. Before I close, I did want to share and highlight that I hope um, everyone was able to, to take a look at that most recently, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services uh, released a commitment to um, reimbursing 
for traditional healers and natural helper services in the Medicare and Medicaid program. Um, this is an incredible step forward in advancing health equity in our healthcare system by valuing the wisdom and the, again, the traditional practices of indigenous communities. And California is specifically one of four states approved to reimburse these traditional healthcare practices through our Medi-Cal program. Um, and again, this is, I, I think, a direct testament to the voices of many of our community organizations, tribal leaders that really spoke to the power of these practices in promoting good health and I think serves as an incredible model for our mental health system in California to do the same. So I wanted to make sure folks saw that and I think the Commission staff can share that with our commissioners to make sure um, you have that in your hands. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Vice Chair. I want to welcome everyone again to today's meeting. The plan is to start, or I'm sorry, the plan is yeah. to end around three o'clock. We will keep you posted on that as um, we have a lot of business to take care of today. Ma Commissioners Chair, who are... Before you get started, can I also, or is this the right time to um, jump in? Just in you a want, moment. Go ahead. Go Thank ahead. you. Yes, sir. Commissioners who are online, if you have, if you leave the teleconference meeting for any reason and decide to rejoin, please make sure to use the raise hand function so the commission staff can make you a co-host again. It is now time for agenda item three, general public comment. This time is reserved for comments on items that are not on the agenda. So for individuals providing public comment on Zoom, you will see a smaller timer in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. This timer will let you know how much time you have left for your public comment. Members of the public can also email us public comment at public comment at mhsoac.ca.gov. Comments submitted 72 hours prior to the commission meeting will be shared with commissioners at the upcoming meeting. Comments submitted outside of that window will be shared at a future meeting. Public comments submitted to this email address will not receive a written response. So if anyone is interested in making public comment regarding the announcements or other items, please make those during this public general public comment time. If you have any technical questions, please contact Commission staff at 916-500-0577. So at this time, I will ask that Commissioner Carnivali, please, you wanted to make a comment at this time? Yes, thank you. Uh, I thought it was just worth taking a minute or two to acknowledge there was a, an article that circulated yesterday, and as these articles go, it was a little bit inflammatory, and uh, they, uh, the, the, author, the author uh, was trying to put together a bunch of emails that they received, I guess, from the Public uh, Information Act and try to put together a story, but I think the story was incomplete, and I just want to create some clarifications around that so everybody understands what the, the whole story is. And it, what they were trying to do is tie together two issues. One was uh, a contract a company called Cooth has with the state of California, and the other is a, an information trip that this commission delegation took to, to London. Um, so the first thing is the big picture. The, um, uh, the whole uh, the, Cooth provides a digital solution which was a, a, a contract that they received from HHS. The, this commission has nothing to do with that contract at all. But the importance of it is that it is a digital solution that falls in the category of recommendations we made several years ago for digital solutions to address teen suicide prevention. And in fact, that's what it does. And it's a big part of the Newsom's administration to lean into new technologies to cost effectively get at this youth. And so they're important programs. And during this steep budget deficit, there was a lot of uh, negotiation between the legislature and the governor. And that solution became one of the debated items. And um, as often happens, the governor's office uh, reached out to us to ask us to help them uh, uh, support the arguments, and uh, and that's what we did. We uh, went back and explained our positions on the digital solutions provided generally without any particular comment on any uh, company or any product in particular, and uh, the Newsom administration was very set, as I believe they should be, on, on keeping that in the budget, and so that was the, the nature of those conversations. There were allegations, there was lobbying on behalf of a company and that simply wasn't true and a recent independent investigation uh, uh, cleared that cleared that issue successfully 
The other thing is the trip that went to London, and I covered this extensively in a previous uh, board meeting, but this was an opportunity that the same company, Cooth, happened to organize. Uh, the, the, the event had nothing to do with Cooth. It was an organization of global mental health leaders, and they really wanted us at the table because we're recognized as one of the leaders in innovation, and uh, so it was important to all of them that they, we be at the table. And during the budget deficit, because there were limited budgets, uh, Cooth offered to pay for some expenses for uh, people to travel over there and attend the, that, that particular convening. In addition to that, we had an entire packed week of other, uh, of other meetings, so we took a week of our vacation time to really spend it on commission business, and we were busy from uh, morning to night on that. And, and it, it was, you know, from my perspective, and I reported on this Pre, uh, previously, it was very successful to the point where this was two days before the Labor Party won, and the, the head of the Labor Party uh, mental health policies were actively learning from things that we were saying and vice versa. And so uh, it was a successful uh, meeting. It had nothing to do with the previous issues regarding the digital solutions that were debated in the budgets and, as I said, the independent uh, investigation cleared all of that. So I just wanted to make sure everybody understood the full story that, that was not really captured in some of the emails that were mentioned in the, uh, in the article. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Carnevale. Um, I would like to say that I did um, provide information, a lot of information to the reporter. And um, also what was not mentioned is that Bright Life um, Kids was also a digital application, Absolutely. and we got rave reviews from parents. And county offices across the state were promoting this as a resource. So when talks of um, cutting those programs out for families were being talked about, um, the question was, should we be supporting this? Commission has long been supporting um, these kinds of resources. And I also shared that as of May, we knew that um, Saluna not only was it designed with over 300 youth, um, and so it was shaped very much for California, but 53% of the registrants who had used Saluna at that time were from underserved communities. 80% of the users engaged with self-guided mental health tools. 97% of the users reported positive feedback on coaching sessions. So there was already a lot of engagement. None of that was, um, of course, added to uh, the article. and. Um, and the agendas were shared, full agendas of, of our time there. So, um, you know, in every attempt to be um, forthright, um, you get what you get, I guess, in, in the media or uh, not in the media. Or, you know, you can provide all the information and it's going to be reported how it's going to be reported. So I appreciate you taking the time to say that. Um, general public comment. So anything that was not on the agenda, that's what we're sharing. It's general public comment. You can make a statement, of course. Yeah. Did you want to? Please, yeah. So just on that news article, I really support Digital Solutions as a peer-run organization. We've been long a part of the digital tech suite and of applications. I think this conversation creates an opportunity that I would like to be involved in as a peer-run organization that has long had a track record. and. Working with app companies, I'm currently working to develop a psychiatric advanced directive app application with the technology company Chorus. I think this creates an opportunity to put on record for peers and people with lived experience to be at the table at the forefront and to provide opportunities to be able to look at those budgets to put us at the table as well for opportunities to work because that is actually one of our strengths and Painted Brain is my organization has been at the forefront at actually advocating for that. So I'm really so, uh, happy that that us, that we're uplifting digital solutions in alignment with those apps and we will be working to, to uh, so, you know, support and make sure that, you know, that people are being protected in those apps. Uh, and if you guys would like to include us at the table re relative to those conversations, we would like to provide those insights about what we've experienced with working with technologies and apps. And so um, I look forward to continuing to talk about that. And I'm 
yeah, and that's about it relative to um, digital solutions. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, I just add that this is exactly the kind of conversation that should happen within the innovative uh, program that's in the paper in our packet. And so that's a great area to lean into. Thank you, commissioners. So at this time, we have uh, no other public, uh, no other comments from our commissioners. We are going to move on to general public comment. So I would ask that, Amariani, you please go over public comment procedures. Thank you. All members of the public will have the opportunity to offer comment as described in the agenda. If you would like to comment on an agenda item, please wait until that item starts. You may request to make public comment by clicking the raise hand icon on your computer or the app, or if calling in by phone, push star nine. You will be placed in a queue to comment on that item. When it is your turn to comment, the moderator will unmute your line and announce your name or the last three digits of your telephone number. When you are unmuted, we are able to hear you. We will do our best to take comments in the order they are received. Please note, once the public comment period for the agenda item starts, we will close the public comment queue, so please make requests to comment now. The moderator will insert the word last comment next to the commenter's name or number to identify the last public comment. Members of the public should be prepared to complete their comments within three minutes or less, depending on time constraints. When we reach the end of your time, our staff will let you know, but we will let you finish your thoughts. We don't mean to cut you off, but we do want to help everyone keep time. We truly appreciate your understanding with this process. Lastly, if there are any members of the public using translation technology, please notify the chair and at least twice the amount of time will be given to you during the public comment period. A live meeting transcription or closed captioning is available for anyone participating in the meeting. If that option is not currently visible, please activate the closed captioning feature located in the control bar at the top or bottom of your screen. We currently have one in-person comment and two virtual comments. Our first in-person comment is from Stacy. Good morning, Commissioners. Stacy Hermoto with REMCO, the Racial and Ethnic Mental Health Disparities Coalition. I had planned to present information to the Commission um, regarding serious issues with the administration that has been going on for years. Um, what I found interesting is that um, the Commission has received uh, information from former staff about problems with the administration and they none of these folks that frankly are very reputable they made their um, concerns very clear in correspondence none of them were interviewed or contacted by the investigator so I thought that was very interesting and strange um, but I have to comment on the article um, and Yes, I realize that you can't believe everything you see in the press, but this article, um, what I was surprised is, again, another appearance of conflict. The very commissioners that are implicated by the article are all on the Human Resources Committee that is deciding this. Now, again, perhaps there is nothing wrong but I don't understand why you don't look at this as a conflict, appearance of a conflict of interest. I try to give you the benefit of the doubt, but it, it really looks bad. It, you know, it reminds me of the time, and again, this was many years ago, and I try to think that this was an exception, but the time that you all try to give a contract of half a million dollars to somebody out of the blue who didn't even present a budget, who didn't even say what he was going to do with the money. And then two of you were on his primary advisory committee. And again, maybe there is no wrongdoing and maybe the, the, the company was good. But don't you understand the appearance of the conflict? And maybe because I work in the legislature and other, you can't just act like, well, the letter of the law, you know, and all these technical things. And again, maybe some of those companies or, or organizations 
that benefited were good organizations that serve people. But if the process is not on up, up front, on board, and there's an appearance, I think you have a serious issue. You, you just can't explain these things away. Um, notwithstanding what, what, what you know, you're, you're saying that some uh, of people in my community were, were benefiting from these programs. Again, it's the process. Um, I really hope that this commission understands that the public really is, and the, the community is looking at you and talking about you. And this article, in, in my opinion, might be the tip of the iceberg. Um, so I just hope, I have tried to give you the benefit of the doubt, but I feel like, I, I feel like you're not seeing. So thank you. Thank you, Stacy. Um, <clears throat> our next comment is Josefina. Your line is open. Thank you. Good, good morning, commissioners. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to provide some public comment on this. My name is Josefina Alvarado Mena, and I'm the CEO of Safe Passages, and we're a nonprofit organization. We were also part of the California Reducing Disparities Project, and you have heard, have heard me appear before this commission on many occasions. I want to say that the OAC has been charged with overseeing billions of dollars in public funds. And the MHSA and then most recently the BHSA was passed in part by voters because of the existence of this independent commission that is supposed to be charged with oversight and accountability of these very precious resources. And we as community providers see the mental health crisis that our children and our families are struggling with every single day. And to read the article entitled uh, a California official helped save a mental health company's contract. It flew him to London. And to read the details in the article, it was quite shocking and quite offensive, I think, to everyone in the state that is working tires tirelessly to serve the children and youth and families in our communities. And I really want to um, implore, implore the commission to do the right thing in response to the details that were provided in the article, but also in response to the complaints of the whistleblowers that were also articulated in the article. You have your own staff that have come forward as whistleblowers, and they should have a certain level of protection associated with that, but also that's a huge red flag. That's a huge red flag that something is wrong with the commission and the administration. And the commission has the responsibility to do the right thing. We, the public, have provided you all with our public trust. And that cannot be um, cast aside lightly. That has to be taken extremely seriously. You are representing me and all of the people in California that are not able to participate in the commission. So I would like to ask the commission, implore the commission, to be guided by integrity, accountability, transparency, and to be good stewards of public trust. When we come as advocates and practitioners in front of the commission, we are abiding by the rules, the guidelines, the um, principles of integrity, and we would implore you all to do the same. Thank you. Thank you, Josefina. Our next comment is from Susan. Your line is open. Good morning, everyone. This is Susan Gallagher, Executive Director of Cal Voices. Um, we are the oldest peer-run advocacy organization in California. As many of you know, we sued um, the OAC a few years ago because of some shenanigans that Toby pulled with our contracting process. Um, we did not win out in that battle, but you know our attorney took that on a pro bono basis because we had such a strong case. My point is there's been a lot of things going on with the commission for many, many years. I echo Stacy and Josephina's comments. This has been kind of a sham, you guys. I'm surprised that the OAC is still standing after the Prop 1 has passed. And it's only standing because it's almost like a place to launder money for Newsom's cronies and, and Toby's cronies. These sole source contracts have been going on forever. And you guys taking a trip, anybody that took that trip should recuse themselves from any vote about Toby in this investigation today. 
You have no business voting on that. You stand before the state of California as an oversight body. You are supposed to oversee the counties to make sure they are spending our money properly. And you are being co-opted by big corporations like Cooth that are international corporations that come into our state of California. And you are banding over $300 million to them. Not necessarily you, but you're lobbying behind the scenes for these people to get money. That is not your job. You serve the people. You serve the people. You serve the people with mental health and substance abuse in this state of California. You serve the peers who can't even get on one of your agendas. None of the stakeholder contracts can get on your agendas. We can't even get our goddamn reports published. And you people are taking on top trips to Europe. Are you kidding me? People are dying in the streets. They're being swept every day because there's no mental health services and no housing in the state of California. Keep going on your trips. What kind of commission is this? I am appalled by what I read, and I think there's more, and I know there's more. There's always been more. And you guys are not willing to look at yourselves. How can you transform anything? You cannot stand there, and you cannot vote on Toby today. Many of you cannot do that. Please, act with integrity. The state of California deserves this. The taxpayers of our state deserve this. We are shifting taxpayer funds to for-profit people. And you, many of you are profiting in your own pocket and taking trips to Europe. I've been running a 28, for 28 years, I've been running a nonprofit organization. And guess what? Nobody offered me a trip to Europe. You people are shameful, shameful. And on behalf of Cal Voices, I hope you all vote properly today and that those of you who have a conflict of interest recuse yourselves. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Susie. Thank you. Our next comment is from Merritt. Your line is open. Uh, good morning, uh, commissioners and others. Uh, I wanted to comment on agenda item five. Is this the appropriate time on early intervention? No, thank you. Not at this time. Just for it's for items not on the agenda. Thank you. Okay. Um, we will take a public comment for that item during item five. And then that was our last public comment that we have. Thank you, Mariani. At this time, the commission will now move on to agenda, agenda item four and consider approval of the minutes from the August 22nd <laughs> through, through and September 11th. I'm sorry, August 22nd, September 11th and September 26th commission meetings. We will need to have these as three separate motions and votes. So at this time, I would like to invite commissioners to offer comments or ask questions on any one of the, those meeting minute agenda items. I see no, please. I have chair. a couple just small things that I can share with the staff. If it's, if it's clerical, we can handle that. Are they clerical? Uh, no, it's tops. Okay, then we need to address it right here. Okay. Uh, on page on page three of 28 it said vice chair Alvarez stated the site visit included visiting for the village we didn't actually visit for the village they were only electronically on the screen we were we visited the place before but I just want to make clear we never visited for the village I just want to make sure there's not a mistake around that uh, and then the second one is on it's coming um, on page where we're talking about early intervention in schools we were talking about I said something about schools it starts at the school I'm pretty sure I said it starts at the school and early learning centers so if you could add and oh page 15 of 28 at the top noted that it starts at school and early <coughs> learning centers And then one really small thing, I don't have an MA, I have an MHA. <laughs> it's not small. <laughs> Other comments, questions? 
So we will take public comments. Amariani, are there any public comments on this agenda item? Um, no, I do not see any public comments. All right, then we will now entertain a motion. I ask that all commissioners, both online or in person, unmute their lines. And I would entertain the motion that the commission approve the August 22nd commission meeting minutes. Move approval. Thank Se you, Commissioner Brown. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Commissioner Robinson. We have a motion to approve and a second. Please take roll. Bond trigger. <clears throat> Brown. Aye. Bunch. Here, 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 August 22nd. Correct. Yes. Uh, abstain. Abstain. Carnivale. Yes. Carrillo. Chambers. Aye. Chen. Cortese. Gordon. Aye. Mitchell. Robinson. Aye. Roulette. Aye. Sai. Vice Chair Alvarez. Aye. Madrigal Weiss, Chair Madrigal Weiss. Aye. It passes. Thank you. We are going to move on to the next meeting minutes, September 11th. Do I have a motion to approve? Madam Chair, a question? Um, I haven't seen any minutes from either the 11th or the 26th. Were they provided to us? Were they in the packet? It's like a very short, you probably skipped over it. Because it was closed, I think those were the... Yeah, I, I, I never got those before today, but are they in here? Are they part of the electronic packet? They Take it back. They were in my packet, but they were, they were not in the right section, so. So at this time, do I have a motion to accept those meeting minutes? I need a motion. So moved. Thank you, Commissioner Robinson. A second? Second. I heard roll it. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. If we could please take roll. Bond trigger. Brown. Aye. Bunch. Aye. Carnivale. Aye. Carrillo. Chambers. Stain. Cortese, Gordon, Aye. Mitchell, Robinson, Aye. Roulette, Aye. Sai, Vice Chair Alvarez, Aye. Chair Madrigal Weiss, Aye. The minutes pass. Thank you. And finally, for September 11th, a motion to uh, approve. I will motion. Do I have a second? Thank you. I motioned. And our second is Commissioner Bunch. I would ask that you please take roll. Bontrager. Brown. Aye. Bunch. Aye. Carnivale. Aye. Carrillo. Chambers. Abstain. I actually abstained from the wrong one, but I don't know if I can go back. It was. I'll, I'll make the card. We can clarify. You can clarify right now, and I'll make sure. Okay. You're abstaining? Yes, I'm abstaining. Okay. Cortese, Gordon. Aye. Mitchell, Robinson. Aye. Roulette. Aye. Sai. Vice Chair Alvarez. Aye. Chair Madrigal Weiss. Aye. Passes. The minutes pass. Thank you. Okay, moving on to agenda item five. We will hear a presentation and discussion on early intervention FSPs. As you know, Proposition 1 directs counties to identify early intervention approaches to address the negative outcomes of mental illness and sets aside 
35% of the BHSA county allocations for behavioral health services and supports, which includes funding for early intervention and 35% to support full service partnerships. This will be the first of several discussions the commission will have with DHCS on both topics as we explore opportunities and priorities. I want to alert the commissioners that the handout packet includes written testimony from behavioral health partners on potential priority areas for early intervention. In the coming months, we hope to bring subject matters experts, consumers and representatives from community-based organizations together with our state partners to have further discussions on early intervention. Priority areas for, and priority areas for early intervention. This morning, I would like to welcome Marlies Perez, Division Chief at the California Department of Healthcare Services, to begin our conversation about this important topic. Welcome. Great, thank you so much for having me. I, I really wanna start our discussion out today by sincerely thanking you. We are doing just a tremendous amount of work at DHCS, obviously since Proposition 1 passed in March of just this year. I still can't believe that. It feels a little bit longer with just the rate of activity of things that we've been rolling out. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that this morning, but then deep dive into some of these important topics. Uh, but just recognizing just the wealth of information of the commission, but also of the public that have been just on this journey with us as well. And just that, like you said, this is the first of discussions. Uh, and so really excited to uh, just bring a lot of information to you today. And so I'm gonna talk once again a little bit about where we're at and our thinking around early intervention, um, and then also wanna move into a full service partnership. Uh, but before we do that, I do just wanna bring everybody up to speed on what we've been doing at the department around Proposition 1, which we call behavioral health transformation. And so starting in the spring, we kicked off a lot of stakeholder engagement activities. Uh, hopefully you've seen a lot of these, but we've been rolling out public listening sessions. And if you've missed any of them, we have all of them posted on our website with some summary notes. Uh, and those are really focused on some of the the first big key topics as we are rolling out some of our, our draft guidance and we'll continue to roll out into 2025. We're also utilizing our traditional DHCS forums and creating some others um, in order to ensure that everybody has a chance to weigh in on this effort. Uh, we've also released in the summer of 2024 uh, around the bond, so DHCS, as I'm sure you know, um, is lifting up uh, close to $4.4 billion in a general obligation bond through our behavioral health continuum infrastructure pro project, and that's really where we're basically building out capacity in California, bricks and mortar facilities for mental health and substance use disorder. Uh, we've already been lifting up over $1.7 billion um, that we've awarded under our funding outside of the bond, and now we have another $4.4 billion to award. So that request for application is out, it's open, and we're actually, it's closing in uh, December, on December 13th, uh, but then we'll be making those awards in the March, uh, Mar excuse me, the spring of 2025, and then in the spring we'll be releasing that second round um, of applications as well. So moving pretty fast there, um, but we've been receiving an overwhelming response so far uh, for that opportunity. And then really what we're marching toward right now is getting this policy guidance out for our counties and our local communities um, in order to engage in that planning process uh, for that county integrated plan. And so that county integrated plan is due to DHCS in June of 2026. And so we recognize we need to get this guidance set in order for everybody to do their local planning process. And how we are doing that is we're doing something a little different and unique at the department. We're gonna be putting out one policy manual that has all of the policy for behavioral health transformation. It is gonna be big because <laughs> there's a lot of policy. Uh, so we're releasing it in modules. And so our first module is going to be going out for public comment uh, before the end of 2024. And I know what you're saying, Marlies, there's only about two months left, I know, but it's gonna be coming out. It'll be out for three weeks and we just really hope to hear um, from everybody about that first module and on the, the heels of that will be module two. So really what module one and module two will have all of the guidance counties and local entities need in order for that planning 
and that will be finalized also in early 2025. So a lot of um, pieces moving on that will of course be announcing when we release that module and really hope to hear from everyone because you know, while we've been having all of these stakeholder meetings and, and, and working with everybody, it's really important to actually see what we're thinking about. And, and I'll be talking a little bit about that today. You'll see some of that, but to see it in writing and to just receive feedback. Um, so with that, oh, I have the clicker. Sorry about that. So I just want to deep dive, quick, you know, right into early intervention. And so uh, what I want to talk to you a little bit about today is just some of the general requirements just to bring folks up to speed uh, if you're not as familiar with the legislation um, but then also just really go over with you some of the the ways that the department is looking at implementing this and putting out the guidance and so hopefully most of you know but with early intervention this is now in the behavioral health services and supports bucket which is 35 percent of the funding going out to the counties. And so of that 35%, 51%, at least 51% has to be used for early intervention. And you take that early intervention bucket and at least 51% has to be used for young people, children and youth um, 25 years and younger. So obviously it's a big, pretty big portion um, of that bucket. And so uh, I do just want to touch on before we go too far down into early intervention, there are other components um, in that uh, BHSS bucket. Um, those are the children, adult, and older adult system of care, outreach and engagement. There's some workforce education and training, capital facilities and technological needs, and then innovative behavioral health pilots and projects. I do just want to recognize, I know that the commission has $20 million um, for innovation. Um, that, this is separate, and this is basically in all the buckets that we just want to be continuing to encourage innovation uh, throughout all three of the buckets. So that's what this piece uh, entails. So with early intervention, so this is housed in section 5840 uh, of the Welfare and Institution Code, and so the def it defines early intervention as those um, that it's services to uh, prevent mental illness and substance use disorders from becoming severe and disabling. I do just want to say up front that does not mean individuals that could be receiving early intervention services need a diagnosis. That is pre-diagnosis. Um, this is really getting folks, you know, um, young people, adults, everybody, um, before they need treatment services. And so this would include uh, indicated prevention and case uh, identification. And so this is a model here that we are very familiar with using in behavioral health. And so um, you'll see here, uh, we are looking at that indicated and case identification, that that's where uh, the definition falls for innovation, excuse me, early intervention. And so once again, um, these are services that, um, as I mentioned, at least 51% of this funding has to be spent for young people 25 and younger. And so for children and youth, you know, there is a requirement in the statute that um, these are designed to meet their needs, um, their social, emotional, uh, developmental and behavioral health needs. And so just, you know, this is a, a really important effort around early intervention, as we all know, but also this special focus on our young people in California. And so with that, I just wanted to highlight around this piece about children and youth. Um, you'll see here, and this is actually drawn right from the statute in 5840 and 5892. But it really is also making sure that there's a prioritization on childhood trauma and then really looking at, you know, different ways that that can be done, whether that is, you know, those root causes of, through, that's identified through ACEs um, or other uh, social determinants of health. Um, and once again, um, these strategies really need to be focused on certain populations. It doesn't mean other populations can't be served, but with an emphasis on youth experiencing homelessness, the justice involved, um, child welfare involved, um, 
And then once again, other populations that are identified as they may be at risk of developing a mental health condition or a substance use disorder. Um, and then once again, any children and youth that are in specific populations uh, that have, you know, identified disparities that we all know, um, but that could be, you know, really beneficial um, for that population as well. Um, so with this, I did just want to highlight um, on this slide here, you're going to see, because obviously we've been doing early intervention services in California, um, but there has been additions to um, these adverse outcomes, and you'll see here in yellow, um, these are the ones that have been added into the law. And so you'll see, um, obviously there's been some pieces around substance use disorder that has been woven in, recognizing that the substance use disorder population is now uh, eligible for services under the Behavioral Health Services Act. You'll see that framed here around overdose. Um, but you'll also see the emphasis once again around kids and school and some more defining around that as well. And so I did just want to put up here, um, once again, recognizing a lot of work has been done, really good work um, under MHSA, uh, but just showing how some of these uh, differences between what's currently being done in MHSA and then moving into BHSA. Uh, so one of the changes uh, in BHSA is that there needs to be a target for early childhood, so zero to five, um, and that can include the infant and childhood mental health consultation. Um, there's also throughout all of BHSA, and not just an earlier intervention, but a priority to advance equity and reduce disparities. You're going to see that throughout um, anytime the department's talking with you, um, but also as you are reading the legislation and then just seeing the policy uh, that we're putting out at the department. Um, and then a really important key piece too, and this is woven throughout, um, but also emphasized in EI, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some of the work we're doing around that. But this emphasis around community-defined evidence-based practices, um, and then you'll see also um, other evidence-based practices and models as well. And, and you're really going to see that um, not only through EI, but when I get to full service partnership and the work and just really lifting up um, some of the services that are being provided in all of these spaces um, and really ensuring that these services are done to fidelity. Um, and then another piece here just to wrap up here around some of the differences with EI is really ensuring that it's addressing the needs of those individuals that are at a high risk of crisis. Once again, getting to them um, before that crisis develops. Um, we do just want to also point out, while there is a lot of guidance already in statute, that counties also can add their own priorities. Once again, especially as you see um, some of these topics I just mentioned, um, that there are obviously many different local issues that are pertain to maybe just either specific areas in the county for specific populations or, um, you know, we all, I hear it all the time and we all know uh, one county, you've seen them, you've seen one county. Um, so it does have that flexibility as well. So for um, the components of early intervention, um, there are three that are outlined. Um, the first being around outreach. Um, the second is access and linkage to care. And then the third is for mental health and SUD treatment services and supports. And so um, all of these, all of our county partners are gonna have to be standing up uh, these three components in their early intervention programs if they don't already have them established. Um, so the first one around outreach. So um, what we are looking at, because um, we are in the process of, you know, putting out the definition around outreach, but first of all, it must be directed toward the BHSA priority populations. And once again, that is throughout, and that is a tenant um, of all of BHSA. Um, and that includes older adults and youth. And you'll see here I included the citations. Um, and outreach cannot be directed at an entire population. This is not population-based um, outreach services. It's not, you know, this is where the, the line is kind of drawn. These services and these activities are really geared under EI towards individuals, um, not like a broad-based um, 
population-based approach. Um, the outreach has to have the goal of identifying individuals for access and linkages to services and or for treatment or other support. So once again, very individual focused. Um, and then the outreach must be able to connect those individuals um, to these programs and supports should an individual wish to be connected to services. So just wanna be crystal clear, when outreach activities are conducted with individuals, some individuals aren't gonna be receptive and recognizing, especially back on that list I was just talking about in these different communities, we're not expecting <laughs> that. And these people that are being outreached to doesn't mean they, they probably don't even have a diagnosis, they may not have a diagnosis, they're at risk. But it's directed for individuals. Um, so that is really where we are, you know, looking at drawing that, that line and that clarity around early intervention. Um, but once again, I just want to be crystal clear. It doesn't mean they may not even get referred into treatment. They may just have outreach. There may be an access or linkage provided. They may not choose to do that. Or they may, after that, they may not need services. But just wanting to make sure that that is very clear um, in what is allowable. And they may just receive an outreach service and that, that's it. Um, but once again, it's, or they may receive multiples, what we're hoping, um, because if they do need some sort of other support, or even some sort of care that they then receive that. So ac access and linkage to care. Um, so ac in this category here, it must contain a component that focuses on access and linkage to medically necessary care. So once again, it's that, that reach out and offering if services are needed or some sort of support. Um, so Things that access um, and care should include, but this is not a limited list, but is um, having um, referrals to early psychosis intervention, if that is needed, uh, coordinated specialty care, um, other similar evidence-based practices or community-defined um, evidence practices. Once again, either that around psychosis, mood disorder, or other um, types of interventions. Um, activities that have a focus on screening, assessment, referral, um, that could include helplines, um, mobile response. And once again, this is not an exhaustive list, but just a demonstration um, of what we would be looking for um, in this bucket around access and linkage. And then that third bucket around mental health and SUD treatment services and supports. Um, so really this is once again, um, having these services and supports that are effective in preventing the mental health illness and or substance use disorder from becoming severe. Um, and once again, with this, um, it really needs to demonstrate that it's been effective at meeting that cultural and linguistic needs um, of the individuals. Um, and then it may include services to address first episode psychosis, and then once again, service, any other services that are you know, designed to prevent, respond, or treat a behavioral health crisis um, or any activity there that decreases the impacts of suicide. And so what I wanna talk about here right now um, is some of, you know, really looking at these three buckets that I just walked through and then kind of how they line up with currently with MHSA. And so here around stigma and discrimination reduction. Um, so these programs really align with population-based prevention efforts, um, which that is going to be funded under the California Department of Public Health. Um, but there is other funding sources that counties receive. There are SAMHSA um, substance abuse uh, and prevention block grant dollars that can be utilized um, for these services as well. And so just wanted to highlight uh, when counties are preparing that integrated plan that they're going to be submitting to the department, they will be providing how they're utilizing all of their behavioral health funding sources. Um, so they will be identifying their prevention dollars as well. Um, now this, they won't have any BHSA dollars to provide in that category, but they will have these other funding sources as well. And even some counties are using like their opioid settlement funds to do prevention activities also. So you're going to see some of that activity when you see those county integrated plans, but it's not gonna be coming um, from the BHSA bucket. 
Um, so another topic I want to talk about, so in the legislation, there's a requirement for a development of a biannual um, evidence-based practice list. Um, so we are going to be developing that list. I want to be clear, it's non-exhaustive. Um, it is going to, if there is an evidence-based practice or a CDEPT um, that's not on the list, it doesn't mean that providers or counties can't utilize that. Um, but we will be putting together um, this list in consultation with you folks. Um, I don't have any list to present today. That'll be another day. Um, but uh, we're pretty excited about that. We will, you know, once again, it's going to be more of a reference tool um, for the counties and others to locally implement. Um, and then if a county is demonstrating gaps in services, you know, as we are providing oversight from the department, um, or they're struggling to meet performance measures that we'll be setting um, later on in this process, we do have the authority to require a county to implement a particular evidence-based practice or CDEP from this list. So we have been doing a lot of research and a lot of stakeholder engagement. Um, these are some of the sources um, that we are going to be utilizing as we are looking at putting together this list. And once again, the list will be updated um, as well as that is a requirement in statute. So just wanted to give you just a little taste um, of what we've been, been researching and what we've been looking toward um, around these EBPs and CDEPs. But we don't have anything established, just to circle back on that. Uh, so more to come in this space. Uh, but as we are looking at it, um, we're really looking at, you know, whatever ends up on this list, that it has the evidence, it's well supported. Uh, and, but it also could be promising and emerging, um, you know, especially as we recognize in certain communities around CDEPs, maybe there isn't as much evidence in the sense of research, but evidence in the results um, for the communities. Uh, and so with those CDEPs, just really making sure um, you know, what kind of perceived outcomes or, you know, positive outcomes are coming out of those CDEPs um, that uh, we are seeing in that space. Um, of course, really important one here is looking at the cultural evidence uh, that the CDEPs or EBPs are demonstrating. What types of populations are they serving? Uh, the risk and protective factors and then what type of program type. All right, so I'm gonna take a small breath and now we're gonna to switch to FSP. <laughs> so we're gonna move on over to um, the bucket of full service partnership, which I know, um, you know, holds the heart here uh, of the commission. I know EI does, I don't know which one you guys are more passionate about, but um, do wanna step into this space. Uh, so with full service partnership, I do just wanna run through uh, the core components and then get into a deeper dive I am gonna go a little deep on some of the clinical things for the clinicians here in the room or on the phone. Um, just so you know some of our thoughts, we're gonna also um, talk about the levels of care. There's a lot in this 35% bucket. So um, I'll try not to be too much of an auctioneer, um, but I'm trying to whip through this so we can open it up for comments and discussions as well. So as I mentioned already, this is a 35% uh, of the bucket of funding. And then, uh, as most of you know, and I'm not going to talk about it today, um, the third bucket is 30% for housing. Um, but with that, um, and the housing, so housing is no longer would be funded under full service partnership. And I'll talk a little bit about that because there's that whole 30% for housing. And that housing isn't going to be limited to just full service partnership anymore. It's anybody that is eligible for BHSA and then also meets definitions around um, needing those housing services. Um, so with full service partnership, um, I do want to point out there are um, some exemptions that counties can request, and we'll talk a little bit um, further around that um, during their integrated plan process. But for this first integrated plan, the only exemptions um, that actually apply across all of BHSA um, are for our smaller counties at 200,000 population or less. So this uh, is a very busy slide, so I apologize about that. But it really outlines, because there's so much going on in the space of FSP. And so what I'm going to focus on today, um, because 
some of these other components are already clearly defined, but I'm going to really focus in on number two here around um, assertive community treatment and forensic assertive community treatment. And I'm just gonna from now on call them ACT and FACT. Um, and then we're gonna talk about individual placement and supportive model of supportive employment, which I'm just gonna say supportive employment. Uh, and then we're gonna talk about high fidelity RAP as well. Um, then I'm gonna move into a little bit around the space of something that's very new um, under BHSA is around assertive field-based initiation for SUD services. Um, and then also we're gonna talk about the levels of care. So with FSP, um, it's really comprised of required and allowable services. And so the FSP programs need to make the required services available in order to you know, get approval from DHCS on their, their county plan. Um, allowable services are additional that can be offered um, underneath um, this FSP bucket. And so the required services um, you'll see here are the mental health services, supportive services, and SUD services, uh, that assertive field-based initiation for SUD, um, outpatient behavioral health services for evaluation and stabilization, engagement services, service planning, um, and then as I'm gonna deeper dive into the ACT and FACT um, or FSP ICM that we're gonna talk a little bit about, uh, the high fidelity RAP, and then that individual placement and support model of supportive employment. Um, you'll see here the allowable services, once again, as I've kind of already touched on, but housing interventions, but not funded under FSP, that's got its own bucket now. Um, but also um, primary SUD FSPs, um, and then also any other additional EBPs, outreach and engagement, and then other non-clinical services. So I think this is really important as we're kind of setting the stage here. Um, if you're following at DHCS, we have submitted our Behavioral Health um, Connect waiver, and um, it has not been approved yet, but you're gonna see a lot of alignment in how we are rolling out that BH Connect waiver, especially around um, these evidence-based practices and how they <laughs> coincide with BHSA. Uh, and so while there are some differences in the sense that Medi-Cal is an entitlement program, so anybody that is you know, receiving Medi-Cal services are entitled um, to receive these, that is different under BHSA. Uh, while these models have to be stood up um, and provided it's not and entitlement. Uh, but so yes, you're gonna see this mirroring and I will um, touch a little bit on some of the nuanced differences, but for the most part, um, there is a very close alignment. Uh, and one really important part of FSP is as we're rolling these out, uh, we are setting up centers of excellence to provide support for our providers and our county partners. We recognize um, there are some counties that are doing some of these models already, but maybe they're not doing them to fidelity. Or they haven't done these models yet and they need assistance getting started and then moving toward fidelity. We recognize this is a pretty big lift um, for our county partners and it's going to take some assistance to get this implemented for them. And so with this, um, once again, there are fidelity standards that we're going to be lifting up not only for BH Connect, but also for BHSA under FSP. And I'm super glad. I really apologize for all the acronyms. I will I keep, but I think we're all good with FSP. And I already did my disclaimer on the other ones, but um, yeah, I apologize. It's riddled with them. <laughs> So for uh, the evidence-based practices, so now we're talking about ACT and FACT, and just for those of you that aren't familiar with um, you know, ACT and FACT, well, I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail on each of the slides. So just hold, hold with me for just a second. Um, but for ACT and FACT, IPS, and High Fidelity RAP, counties are gonna be required to be implementing these beginning July 1 of 2026. So once BHSA officially starts, they need to be starting implementing if they haven't already had these programs um, in their FSP model. 
Um, then they will also be required to be lifting up full service partnership, the ICM, intensive case management. We're going to talk about that a little, in a little bit more detail because that's part of the level of care discussion. And then also that assertive field-based SUD. So all of that needs to be started in July 1 of 2026. However, counties are going to have 18 months to complete that first fidelity review. And so that's really getting, they're going to have technical assistance provided during that 18 month period. They're going to have a fidelity review by the Center of Excellence. And then after they have that fidelity review, they're going to get more technical assistance to really help them get up to the par. So by June 30th of 2029, these are being run by, to fidelity. So that is the goal. So they need to start them. We're going to help training do the fidelity assessment through the Centers of Excellence, do more training and assistance to get them up to fidelity. Um, so I kind of mentioned earlier that our small county partners do have uh, an ex exemptions that they can request under this bucket, under full service partnership. And so, once again, it's only for those small county partners for this first county plan. There are other exemptions for other subsequent um, county plans, and I'll talk about that in just a second. But what we are looking at doing for that first integrated plan for our small um, counties is that small counties are going to be exempt from meeting the fidelity requirements of ACT and FACT, but they still need to provide that ICM service. Um, when they're doing their fidelity reviews, they can look to see, can I get up to act in fact? Do I have the population? Do I have the clinicians? Do I have the support? And they can receive that technical assistance to then see come 2029, maybe I can reach that fidelity or maybe I need to request an exemption from that act in fact level. But they still need to be providing that intensive case management. They can, uh, they're also going to be exempt from meeting the fidelity requirements for that IPS model of supportive employment and also high fidelity rep. And then for, as I already kind of mentioned, as we move into 2029, still talking about our small county partners, um, they will then be able to apply for an exemption if they meet this following criteria. And this would be requesting an exemption to act fact and or the fidelity requirements for IPS and or high fidelity wrap. They're gonna to have to demonstrate to the department, like is it a workforce issue? Is there limited need? Um, or if there are other types of considerations that we need to take into play as we're you know, looking and reviewing to see if we're gonna approve this exemption. And then there's different documentation requirements. So this is just a small sneak peek. This is 2029, but just wanted to let you know um, where we're looking at going um, down the road for our small counties and exemptions. So I've been doing nothing but throwing acronyms at you, so I do want to spend a little time going even deeper diving, if you're all still with me. Uh, I told you this would be for a lot of my clinician friends out there. I know there will be a test. I heard that. I hope I can pass the test. Um, so the statute requires uh, the department to establish levels of care. And so we have been developing uh, a model around levels of care. And so since, so ACT is that highest level of care. Um, and this is, you know, a required service. Um, and it's an evidence-based practice. And so really the ACT model and then the FACT model, just to say really quick, I'm sure you've figured out, if you don't know already, that's the forensic lens of it, um, of ACT. Um, so that would be, um, we're proposing that that would be the highest level of care in the FSP model, that ACT in FACT. Um, and then the step down from ACT would be having an FSP intensive case management. And so really what the difference there with that ICM is that it is going to get to those individuals that may not need that higher level of care that ACT provides um, or that eligibility for ACT, but they still have significant needs where they could benefit 
from this model. And we really feel that a lot of the current FSP programs are already, you know, including this level of care. Um, and so, but what this is going to do is really have a standardization of this ICM that isn't necessarily around the state right now. But we do feel like a lot of counties are, are providing this in, and what's so effective in that, that model of care. Sure. Yeah, so I was just asked what the difference is between kind of the, the clinically level one and level two. Um, I'm just going to pause that slightly because I have some great slides on that. It's a lot around the model of itself and the intensity of the services. Um, but to, to your point, what we're seeing is such a range of what our FSP programs are currently providing county to county. There isn't the standardization. Um, and then even with some of the models, they're not necessarily being done to fidelity. Like even in the ACT, there's counties that are doing ACT, but it may not be done to fidelity. So what these levels of care is, you know, and once I get into kind of the unique differences in them, but it also brings that standardization. And then once again, with that fidelity assessment also. That's, that's what I think is really unique. Um, to what the legislation well requires and allows us to do. But I, I promise I'm going to get to you because um, I have some great slides for you on that. And hopefully they're the next ones. <laughs> there are. Okay, so here's one of the first ones. Um, so this is just a, a visual of the levels of care. I do just want to state um, that after that level one, then we could see folks moving into the general outpatient, especially mental health services. Um, and so once again, this is a level of care framework for mental health services. Um, and, and folks could come in at any one of these levels and, you know, move through. They don't have to start at the top and move down. Um, they would come in, you know, where their need is. And then with this level of care model, like we talked about, the, the two levels that I already discussed, um, those could be funded under full service partnership. But then if they're stepping down into those outpatient services, those would be funded um, under BHSS or, of course, Medi-Cal or other funding sources. All right, so we're going to get into your question a little bit here. So the ACT service components you'll see here, um, and once again, these are all mirroring what we have in the Medi-Cal benefit under BH Connect. Um, and so under FSP, these need to be made available to uh, non-Medi-Cal individuals um, that are receiving FSP. And of course then that they are meeting that clinical eligibility for the highest level of care that they need. But these are some of the service components um, that are under the FACT model. And as I mentioned once again, FACT is really that tailoring um, of the model to our justice-involved individuals. Uh, and then really we're proposing that counties can adjust this FACT model um, based on the needs that they have locally for this population. Um, so in some instances that may be they have a dedicated FACT team. Um, in other instances it may be that they have like someone that is on their ACT team that can, you know, maybe it's a dedicated FACT member or, you know, that's ready to serve individuals that have that fact need. Um, and then it could also be that an ACT team has someone with lived experience or they, you know, all of the ACT team completes the fact training. But there's different ways um, that our counties can get to meeting this requirement around fact. And once again, I'm just going to keep repeating myself. This is what we have the centers of excellence, the training, the technical assistance, the fidelity measurements. And that fidelity um, is not just for this first integrated plan. This is fidelity is like a part of the model now. Um, and those assessments continue um, through all of the subsequent integrated plans. So then that 
Other level of care, the intensive case management under FSP, um, you know, I think everybody's pretty familiar with this model. Um, it really is that, once again, it's what a lot of our folks are already doing around um, FSP, but it's that comprehensive set of those community-based services. Um, you know, it doesn't have a fidelity criteria like ACT, but it basically is combining those general principles of case management um, with low staff to client ratios, um, assertive outreach and direct service delivery. And so really looking at kind of, I'm still getting to your question. I know it takes me like five slides to answer it, so I apologize. Um, but like, what's, you know, who might be served under ICM? And so once again, as I talked about before, it could just be stepping down from an ACT or a FAC service um, and that they're clinically, you know, yes, this individual is ready, you know, for that step down. Um, it may be those that just come into FSP and they need a moderate to significant level of support, but not as intensive um, as the ACT model. Um, it could be individuals that have a co-occurring disorder, because once again, we're, you know, talking about this for the, the mental health um, levels of care. Um, we also just want to point out that individuals that are 18 to 26 um, and may, or they could also be younger and maybe they're not connected to children's services. If clinically they feel, the clinician feels they could benefit from ICM, this could be another um, alternative for them as well. Um, so the components, uh, the service components here, um, you know, once again, individuals may need some or all of these um, components. Uh, I do also just want to point out this list is not exhaustive. Um, additional services can be provided um, on an ad needed basis. And so you're going to see here, they may need um, all or some of the same services as ACT, but where the big difference is, is the number of individuals being served and who's on these teams providing these services. It's really around that um, intensity of need for these clinical services. Do you feel like I answered your question yet or do you wanna? <laughs> okay, perfect. Okay, great. And. Um, I don't have it today, but we do have um, more around like the staffing patterns. I just thought if I brought too much of this, you're gonna be sleeping and you'd be like, it's your time to get off the, the floor, Marlies. But anyway, we do have that mapped out as well that we're getting feedback on. Um, of, and, and once again, it's, it's really about that staffing component and how many people um, can be served under these two different models as well. Can you share the staffing component? Is that something you can send us? Yeah, sure. Okay, I'd be interested. Yeah, no problem. I'm going to send it right to you. Now, I'll get it to um, Tom and we'll get it out to you folks. Oops, I passed, went too fast. Um, so for um, FSP levels of care for children and youth, um, we are going to be requiring high fidelity wrap as an evidence-based practice. Um, and in just really working with high fidelity wrap, and, and once again, as, as an EBP done to fidelity, um, there really isn't research or subject matter experts that support defining multiple levels of care um, for children and youth. Um, they really feel that the high fidelity wrap service, um, it really has built into it the design of really being able to increase or decrease the level of intensity of services um, for children and youth. Um, now, just want to be clear that the legislation doesn't restrict counties um, from establishing FSP programs uh, that have multiple levels of care, um, so that can be done. Um, however, we are not going to be requiring multiple levels of dedicated care for SS FSP for children and youth because we are requiring that high fidelity wrap model, once again, done to fidelity. Um, so for the high fidelity wrap, um, once again, this is, um, I'm, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here, but it's a team-based, family-centered, evidence-based practice. Um, and once again, it's that anything that's necessary 
uh, for children and youth um, living with the most intensive mental health or behavioral health challenges. Um, you know, it's really seen as an alternative to out-of-home placement for children with complex needs. Um, you'll see here some of the tenants around it of making sure that, you know, the family's involved in the decision making, um, that there's, you know, a structured um, set of strategies of how they approach. Um, it's also delivered by a high fidelity RAP facilitator that has a team that is working um, throughout the process with the child or youth. Um, and then there, there's these four phases um, that are involved in the, the high fidelity RAP model. Um, these are the service components. Um, and once again, these service components mirror what we're requiring under Medi-Cal. Um, and you'll see here, um, there is a bundled rate here. And then there's also these additional services that aren't bundled that um, will be available under high fidelity RAP. We're still landing some of this guidance. We're a little bit more out front um, with high fidelity RAP than our Medi-Cal piece. But once that Medi-Cal um, high fidelity wrap lands, um, it'll be mirrored in FSP. I want to move on to individual placement and support. Uh, so once again, this is another evidence-based model that um, we'll be requiring. And um, so around, obviously, we all recognize the importance of employment services. And so this is, you know, a recognized model around supportive employment. Um, this can be integrated into those other FSP services that I've been talking about. Um, and then also, you know, it's going to be mirroring that Medi-Cal benefit. Um, so some of the IPS principles, um, you know, around zero exclusion, competitive employment, you know, it's also helping the individual even get ready to, you know, pursue employment. Um, it's a part of the psychosocial rehabilitation. Um, and, and the whole point is to help individuals find and maintain their jobs as a part um, of their recovery. And it's built on these principles. For those of you still awake, I'm almost done with my EVP list. <laughs> oh, I'm so happy. I've got some excited folks to the right. Woo, awesome. Um, so the next one I want to talk about that is brand new, that hasn't been done under uh, MHSA, is the Assertive Field-Based initi Initiation for Substance Use Divor Disorder Treatment Services. And so what this is, this is the definition that we're proposing to be outreach, engagement, and initiation of treatment for substance use. Um, and I do just want to highlight, particularly around medications for addiction treatment in any low barrier setting. But this is for all uh, substance use disorders. And once again, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this uh, low barrier setting approach that we are recommending. So the model is really, um, the requirement will be for counties to either be strengthening or expanding their existing or standing up these three services um, slash kind of models here. The first is conducting ongoing data informed targeted outreach. Um, and so you'll see a little bit, this could be conducted by their mobile field-based teams um, or could be conducted separately. Um, the second is around the mobile field-based programs. Um, so once again, this is really getting out there where folks are in the field. Um, and this could just be first maybe in the outreach setting, but also um, for individuals that are ready and willing to have access to medication assisted treatment right there. Um, you know, really with trying to target out those that are at higher risk of overdose. Um, and then really making sure that as they're out there in the field that they're also providing not only medication assisted treatment, but um, naloxone and, and other uh, very important medications, information, education, um, to the individuals that they're serving. And then the third is open access clinics. And this is really, once again, um, models to where, and we have some of these in, in California bridge clinics um, and other low barrier MAT access services. We have some of our syringe exchange uh, programs that we've been working with at DHCS that actually provide MAT on site already. So using and expanding models such as those. 
Um, so what we mean by rapid MIT access is really working to ensure same day MIT access. Um, and so one way to ensure that this can happen is having uh, prescribers on staff um, or really having nearby referrals that are ready to be made, whether it's through an FQHC or Indian Health Clinics, narcotic treatment programs, whatever is available um, in that setting. Uh, also, an effective model has been telehealth um, that can ensure access to MIT as well. And so um, I do just want to quickly, I think that was my last slide on this assertive field-based initiation. I do just want to recognize really quickly the importance of this EBP and recognizing, you know, as it's been really exciting to see recently some of the overdose rates coming down nationally. Um, we still have a very large problem in general in this country in this space. Um, and really with this evidence-based practice is we just need to continue to do better in California. We need to ensure ultimately that if someone has an opioid use disorder that they understand that there's an evidence-based treatment, that's medications for assisted treatment, and that they have access to that. And so this is really um, what the focus is of this EBP, is to keep pushing our state forward to obtain that goal. And so with um, substance use disorder treatment um, services, um, as I mentioned before, um, they need to you know, have this evidence-based practice um, as a part of their FSP model. Um, and then really also what we're looking at with these FSP teams is really that they can also just support individuals um, that are living with co-occurring mental health and or substance use conditions, which may be a little bit unique to some of the current FSP teams. They may not have that, um, but that's what we're looking um, to expand out. Oh my gosh, you guys are gonna be so excited. I think this is my last slide. Um, so that concludes, concludes my marathon on FSP, uh, but I did want to make sure that you have these uh, resources that I've mentioned, some of them already to you, but at the department we have our Behavioral Health Transformation website. We have all kinds of information on there about stakeholder engagement, resources, fact sheets. Um, we also have those public listening sessions that I mentioned. Uh, we do have one coming up on October 30th. Uh, we'll be doing full service partnership little sneak preview. I'm going to be running through a lot of what we discussed today, um, but that will, I'll be hosting that on the 30th. And then on November 4th, um, I'm going to be doing a listening session on that behavioral health services and supports bucket, that 30%. So those will be available if you want to uh, participate in those or if you want to wrap back later and just see some of the feedback we're receiving. And then the last thing, uh, we have a general inbox for any questions related to behavioral health transformation or feedback. Um, you're always welcome to submit questions there um, or direct folks there uh, for questions for us. And with that, I'm going to open it up to questions. I'm not sure how you folks um, want to proceed with that, but I'll stop talking. <laughs> First of all, thank you very much. And, and we just open up to um, any of our commissioners asking questions or making comments. I see Commissioner Chambers, please. Yes, I just want to say, Marlise, I'm so thankful for DHCS. Um, providing um, stakeholders a seat at the table. I am privileged and honored to be um, in the implementation the stakeholder um, calls and just so honored to learn and just to see the work and collaboration that you all are doing. And so thank you. I look forward to the clear guidelines and the policy manual. That, that's like really the geekiest thing, particularly for clinicians and folks that are practitioners that are excited like us to be implementing these models. So just thank you on that. Um, I just wanna uplift though, the or a call to action i know that this is a big overhaul for the counties but really looking at community-based organizations which are the lifeblood of the, our local communities to really to encourage our counties to um contract with peer-run organizations and organ other places to do this work particularly um i think there's opportunities for the ips work and peers and employment um, and just the counties and overall in substance use. I think also an equity issue and for the state to consider, like particularly us as a small CBO that are excited about um, substance use treatment and um, integration with peer support, but there's also issues of like um, discrimination in areas to operate. Um, it's particularly in just 
and across California, it's just hard to also find areas where people just like landlords and people to um, operate this. So, I mean, I'm looking forward to the counties, but also for CBOs because we are the lifeblood. So really just encouraging the counties to contract with other people outside of themselves. Um, and then I want to encourage the state to also like think about how they're going to localize their entire population outreach because it's being centralized to the state now, right? A lot of the outreach and it's not at the at the the what particular outreach? Sure. Is so uh, the outreach. So outreach for early intervention is still at the local level. Um, there are also other outreach efforts around like that housing and general outreach can be done under the BHSS bucket. So there's still outreach and engagement activities that are done locally. But the bigger systems outreach and engagement or education is state. So. Uh, or am I saying it the wrong? No, that's okay. Let me rephrase it a different way um, can, and to touch a little bit on what you were just saying as well. There's going to be not only those centers of excellence that I talked about, but extensive technical assistance being run out by the department um, to touch on just some of the, the things that you brought up in other areas as well, but getting more providers Medi-Cal certified, helping exactly. the counties get their network expanded, helping counties lift this up. I mean, we have a now a 30% bucket on housing, helping them to connect with their local partners. But at the same time, we're doing a lot of outreach to our partners at the state level, working very closely with our partners at HCD and CalVet as they're lifting up parts of the bond. We're working with CDPH on the population-based prevention. We're okay, working with that, HCHI. Yeah. Okay. So there's like different, yeah. you know, we got a lot of responsibilities <laughs> that we're lifting up, but I do just want to make sure it's very clear that outreach is still available um, at the local level. Um, with the and these side. models. So I don't want to scare anybody. Sorry. Yeah. I was talking about system things. <laughs> Not so at thank all. Thank you for the clarity. Of course. But just overall, thank you for including peers and stakeholders at the table. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, please, Commissioner. Uh, Von Traeger. Yeah, Commissioner Von Traeger. <laughs> yeah, I know your name. <laughs> I guess I need to start by asking to be recognized because uh, I showed up late, <laughs> right? Check the box. Um, first of all, I, I think the, this is great. It's robust. I think it works great for Sacramento and L.A., for the Sierra counties that have 3,000 people or MODOC that has 8,000, it doesn't work. Obviously, they can opt out, but the impact of that is if they can't participate in BH Connect, they won't be able to pull down federal dollars for IMD placements. And the issue then becomes the, the delta between the haves and the have-nots continues to grow. And I'm concerned about that because if you look at areas of misery in this state for overdose rates and other misery indexes, it's in those rural areas. Mm -hmm. And so my fear is we're piling on again. And what, what can be done to either create regional efforts so this delta between haves and have-nots doesn't continue to grow? Yeah, great question. And um, I'm not sure you were here for all of it. And I know it's so much information and this is really expansive. Um, I think what's unique, because I've been in this field um, over 20 years in behavioral health, and you know what we've done so much work in California in, in standing up all these different things and raising up our, our levels of standards for our Medi-Cal benefit, and just the work is historic just to have an MHSA in the first place. And what is different about BHSA is it brings it all underneath one umbrella. And, and what coordinates it together is this county integrated plan, and I didn't talk about it today, but then there's this behavioral health outcomes in accountability transparency report, but a boater, it's basically a mirror of that. But it puts accountability at the local level and transparency, and it puts accountability and transparency at the state level for behavioral health in California. It's going to be performance measures rolling out. But with all of it in the lens of we want to see things get better, we want to see things like you're talking about, it's not just in rural counties, it's in some of our larger counties that have rural populations, but like there's a definite, you know, need to bring all this together, but also for the people we're serving to fidelity, like the time is like they deserve the services clinically to be able to have that. And that's a big piece of BH Connect, that's a big piece of FSP of like, but helping, we recognize it's gonna take time to help people get there. There are a lot of exemptions for our smaller county partners. There's gonna be a lot of assistance in, but what you're gonna also see as we're rolling this out 
is how do we do things differently in behavioral health? How do we streamline efforts? You're gonna see how we're connecting more things together with Medi-Cal and other things and, and how we're doing documentation reform and how we're doing all of these things so we can help our county partners. And I'm just gonna focus on the smaller ones. We recognize one person wears five hats. How can they do all the different reporting? How do they do all the data? But we're looking at all of these pieces to streamline and, and BHSA gives us that ability to do that. And this is not going to happen overnight. This is going to be a process because there's a lot that needs to be put in place. But we don't want to leave our small county partners behind. And, and part of that is them not having enough access to services. And I'm super excited to see how they've been stepping up under BCHIP and getting more you know, grants in. We, we have regional areas of funding to ensure that you know they have that ability and they're doing a, coming forward with a lot of regional models and i'm hoping to see a lot of that um, with the bond applications as well so by no means i live in a small county i don't want to leave our small county partners behind um, they definitely have unique needs um, and we're really as we're you know putting and standing up this policy really looking at that as well, I mean, I know I overwhelmed you with a level of detail. I got, I got a whole nother level under here that I didn't bring forward today. Um, but I do just want to state, we recognize that at the department, there's a vast difference between an urban and a rural county. Um, but we're looking at ways to, you know, help that. But also, I'm sorry if someone lives in a rural county, they deserve just as good services as somebody that lives in an urban area. So how do we make that happen? You know, how do we bring up and support them um, but in the way that works for that model. It's not all going to look the same. And that's where there's a lot of these um, provisions in place to, to, help, to help the counties um, in that space. And I just want to say one last thing. There's some small counties that are rocking it out there that are doing phenomenal work as well. And, and how do we leverage that? And, and how do we help um, whether they do a regional partnership with other folks in the area as well? But it is a huge lift for our county partners. I do just want to um, put that out there as well. Commissioner Brown. Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, thank you for your presentation. It was very well done, and um, I, I don't think I've ever seen anybody get through 53 PowerPoint slides <laughs> as quickly and eloquently as that, so well, well done. Uh, secondly, I just want to echo uh, Commissioner Bontrager's um, concerns and comments and would encourage you, I mean, this thing is still kind of not completely baked yet. Definitely. And I would encourage really looking at at incentivizing regionalization for those small counties on this. They do it with jails. They do it with their jail systems. Those, there's several counties that don't have their own jail. Um, there's no reason, I don't think, that they couldn't, you know, band together and, and, and figure out a way to, to share resources and share uh, responsibilities to, uh, to make this happen. And then my, my, my actual question for you is on page 13, on the early intervention program components, the little asterisk that's down there at the bottom is three outreach access and uh, mental health and substance use disorder treatment services. But it says DCH may include additional components. What, what else is being considered or? Yeah, great question. Um, there's a lot of provisions in the legislation that have given DHCS the authority to include other provisions. We're not, in, we're not considering anything at this time. Um, but that doesn't mean later on down the road that we won't, you know, see something that may be, come along that's more effective. I think as you see the legislation, those provisions in, are in there because what we don't want to have happen is to have a static, stale model of BHSA, recognizing things change and in five, ten years or whatever. So there's nothing under consideration. It's just to oh, keep the door open in case something. And then I do just want to say really quick on the regional approach that both commissioners brought up. There's nothing that limits a county from having a regional approach. Um, and even in some of the, the training that we've been lifting up and like how can that happen and, and, and how, um, you know, I know we're not talking about housing today, but uh, we're also helping counties consider how they do flex pools. And that can be done in a regional model too. Um, so there's a lot of great um, solutions and opportunities in that space. Please, Commissioner Gordon, and then Commissioner Bunch. <laughs> Commissioner Rolette, Commissioner Gordon, and then Commissioner Bunch, please. Thanks, Dave, and I'm actually going to ask an educational question. I don't <laughs> typically do that. Uh, at one point in my career, I was a school, school board, elected school board member. 
And one of the challenges that we had was suspension rates. Mm -hmm. And on um, uh, slide 11, you talk about school suspension. I usually <laughs> talk about FSPs and FACT and ACT because I get to be in that world every day, but I'm not. I'm going to ask about this. And you said an individual-based strategy versus a population-based strategy. And the reason that, that got my attention was because there's an article in the LA Times on the October 14th that talked about a very successful um, population-based strategy to enhance black student achievement that was upended because it was population-based. Now, all of the politics aside, uh, I, I believe that we continue to have this issue because there's resistance to population-based strategies that work for kids, that get at what you have on page slide 11, school suspension and sus expulsion rates for communities of color, black and brown kids. Yes. And then number two, the intersection between behavioral health and education. Dave is much more eloquent uh, <laughs> in terms of talking about that. Other, other commissioners, uh, it's obvious. So really advancing, having the state say, OK, everybody, we need to rethink how we strategize this problem, uh, addressing this problem, because uh, the Current population-based strategies are not working. Black and brown kids are still being suspended at alarming rates. And we got some of the smartest people in the world in California. Some of them are even in this room. <laughs> but that's not working. Mm -hmm. So uh, as the state begins to articulate <coughs> opportunities, I don't know that I would be dependent on the state for the strategies, because I think the local community can identify strategies better than the state can. No mm -hmm. offense. Mm -hmm. Sure. But as the state continues to articulate strategies to get at this on an individual basis, I hope you, when you said that, I thought, oh, that's great. <laughs> I hope you really advance that and hold people accountable to being aggressive around individual strategies that get to that slide, because we don't do well there. Thank you so much. Please, Commissioner Gore. <laughs> thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you, Commissioner Rollette. Uh, I'm, I'm one of the education representatives on the, uh, on, on the commission. And thank you. Thank you for your presentation. And, and thank you and the governor for the CBHYI uh, it's it's been transformational, but there's much further that we can go. And, and I think, just to give give a couple of examples, we have first five commissions uh, in in all the uh, in all the counties, and they sponsor just among others programs like Help Me Grow, which is a screening program. It's already in 30 counties. It's very very uh, cost effective. And it could easily be in, in every county with some higher level of, uh, of support. Uh, we also have a small district association, which is, which is very active and very well connected with, uh, with the smaller districts. But, but basically, uh, the issue is can we continue at the higher levels to bring the education system and the health systems more closely together not only with the goal of early intervention and prevention, but streamlining the system so it's not so complicated to be able to access services. We have this fee schedule, which mm -hmm. my office with uh, Santa Clara County has been working on. Uh, we're, making, we're making great progress, but I think we can do even more. There are 10,000 schools uh, in, in the state of California many of them in underserved areas which don't have access to any of the typical uh, medical services. So, so I, I just encourage it. We, we, have, a, we have another contract with uh, DHCS around social emotional learning has mm -hmm. made tremendous progress. So it's a very exciting time and I think we, we really got to double down mm -hmm. and, and bring, all of these, bring all of these groups and these resources 
uh, together in, in collaboration to find new and imaginative ways to, uh, to deliver the services. But thank, thank you, and, and thank your colleagues as well. Yeah, thank you so much for that. And one small way, um, just to accent <coughs> as well, like at the local level and, and the groups that need to be a part of the planning process, you'll see the addition. I'm sure you've seen that around in the education space as well. So, And yeah. we've been working very closely with our children's advocates and partners at First Five at the state level too. But and, and I appreciate your slides. I will use your slides. Great. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Bunch has given me permission just because we're staying on the topic of education. I just want to add, um, when we're talking about the uh, continuum <coughs> of care, we've done a lot of work in this space with when we're talking about schools, so ranging from the school mental health services to alcove drop-in programs and early psychosis programs. And, you know, we have a demand for these kinds of services across the state. And an example is um, we had 50 applications for new alcove programs in round four, but only six new sites were, were able to be funded. So uh, my question is, how will you include these models in your thinking as you develop the framework for use in future early intervention funds? So that's my question. And then I have a... Yeah, I, I'm very familiar with the alcove model. I think it's incredible. Um, and as you, you mentioned, we, uh, I'm trying to remember where we funded some of those under BCHIP, but I know some of those were funded to expand some of that, that access out as well. Um, you know, I think the alcove model is just one example of what counties can utilize under that, that EI um, bucket of funding, mm -hmm. and especially now that there is such a focus on the youth, because I think that that is such a, you know, great example of a model um, that can be utilized. I also think, you know, and I, I apologize, I'm not as familiar if they're doing as much around substance use disorders, um, but in, in thinking of, that's another opportunity. How do we blend and bring that in together as well? Like we know the co-occurring um, statistics, but like the SUD only, and then and you look at our young people and the high rates of fentanyl overdose, that's really yeah. killing our young people in California. It's heartbreaking. Yeah. And so how do we, I guess I'm, I'm putting the question back on all of us too. How do we think of these models that we have, but ensure that they're reaching, you know, our young people with both of these potential diseases or at risk of it? And, and, and how do we bring that together as well? And, and you're going to see, um, you know, we've been doing some of that work at the department as well under our Medi-Cal benefit and how do we continue uh, to move that forward? So. That's another piece of BHSA that just really, really excites me, is, is bringing down some of those barriers, um, and especially when it comes to our young people. Uh, but yeah, great model. Um, I think what's a little bit challenging, because um, I do oversee um, the Behavioral Health Continuum Infrastructure Program, the need for our facilities in California across the continuum is so great. <laughs> um, so really ensuring that as we're Awarding those, we're looking at geographic distribution to the commissioner's um, earlier point around the rural areas, um, but also our tribal populations. They have some of the worst rates of, of both of these diseases and ensuring that they have the access to the culturally appropriate care. Um, but, you know, it's, it's tough because they're as incredible as this historic investment is. There's only so much funding to, to go around. But, like I said, the alcove model is just one great example of, on that, you know, earlier prevention, early intervention spectrum. Well, and I think my, my question really ties into kind of the next statement I want to just state is there's been such great push and advocacy around including student voice, or student youth voice, student youth voice. And, um, and I want to make sure that we keep that really at top of mind. So. Mm -hmm our marginalized youth, our LGBTQ plus youth, our native youth, but not just their voice, but really embedding them into making decisions and being at the table. Um, they are the future, right? Mm -hmm. And so if we get them, offer them the space at the table to make these decisions that are really gonna be shaping the next system, then I think that's key. So Definitely. at the state level, making it part of the best practice fidelity for the county level so that we can really create those systems that are serving them young and really continuing that on. So I just, 
I think that's more of a statement. So thank no, you. No, that's great. Thank you. And I do just want to highlight on the substance use side, um, the work around with the Prop 64 dollars around Elevate Youth California, because that's exactly that is giving yeah. kids that that voice and that empowerment, but more from the SUD side of the house. So like yeah, in my mind, great. like how do we bring some of this together, you know, right. and continue to move that forward? Because yeah. um, I think that's important as well. So but well, there's you. a learning curve really for the adults when there's like what they're 10 and they need. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, they're 10 and they need treatment. And yep. so we have to get past the shock yep. and really just get to the um, supports. So with that, Commissioner Bunch, please. I uh, so know we're running late on time, so I have many questions, but I'll just, I'll give a comment. And thank you, uh, this was very exciting for me to hear. I am a supervisor at one of the largest clinics for LA County, and have had, we've had a lot of anxiety around mm. what this is gonna look like. Um, this was amazing, because now I feel like I'm more excited than Good. anxious. Um, so I would love to hear, you said you have many levels of this, so I would love to hear the next level, if, if that's a possibility. Sure, so I'm gonna get you some of those slides that I think will help a little bit from your clinical piece, at least around FSP. I think the next level, quite frankly, will be the release of our module one and module two. Like there is, <laughs> that is some next level, because that's really where we're outlining that policy and, and then I think it'll be more helpful for you to see it more comprehensively. And I, I apologize, I just pulled these two pieces because I wanted to make sure we got before you. I know these are key topics, but I think that's gonna help um, provide that level of detail that you're looking for. And can you remind me of the timeline? Sure, around no problem. That? Both module one and module two are gonna be released for draft um, by the end of 2024. <laughs> I'm sorry, every time I say it, I laugh because I'm like, it's okay. like November is next week, but we are on track for that. Um, so I apologize, I don't have a specific date, but we are on track for releasing both of those for comment. Thank you. Vice Chair, please. Thank you. Um, thanks so much for the presentation. I think the, the oh, just kidding. No. Oh, okay. How do we hold systems accountable? I mean, to Commissioner Bontrager's uh, comment and to Commissioner Warlett regarding the diversity piece. Mm -hmm. You know, because at the end of the day, the consumer doesn't care about any of this. <laughs> they just want services. Yeah. So how do we hold counties accountable? Because we constantly create these beautiful plans on paper and you know we do all of this but our families are suffering mm -hmm. how do we hold the counties counties because they are the deliverer the state doesn't and to commissioner chambers point all these you know on the ground uh, community-based programs are out there doing their best how do we hold the counties accountable for doing everything that we say we need them to do because there's an enforcement component mm -hmm, to this. Definitely. So that's my question because at the end of the day, it's about the families, the children, the mm -hmm. parents who need the SUD services, who need the behavioral mm -hmm. health services, the mental health services. How do we enforce this? Yeah. So um, I know we're running behind time, so I'm going to cut my answer very short, <laughs> except to say that, you know. BHA, BHSA brings a level of accountability in California we've never had before. It gives us the viewpoint through that integrated plan and that voter, what are counties planning to do? What did they do with their funds? There's performance measures that are gonna be in place across these systems. So there's tools that we can use at the state level. Of course, also offering a lot of TA, you know, helping, I don't want this just to be a punitive, like we need to help our, our, our providers and our counties get to where they need to be. But we do have enforcement ability now that we haven't had either um, that can be a lever. But I do just want to say, and obviously where BHSA focuses so much on the counties, but there's other provisions in there as well that once again I didn't talk about. But, um, you know, counties aren't the only ones that hold responsibility in California for behavioral health services. We have commercial health plans and we've been working with DMHC. Um, and really trying and it's going to take us some time, but crack that nut around commercial insurance and like helping our providers and counties. What are the billing codes? How do you do it? How do you move that needle forward 
as well, because as much as, you know, please don't get me wrong, this has a huge emphasis on our county partners. There are other folks in California that are responsible for services also. Um, so there's, you know, work we're doing with our managed care plans as well. And so BHSA is huge. I mean, it really is transformative. And if you didn't feel like that before you walked in here today, I'm sure you feel like that walking out. But with that, I do ask for a small bit of grace at DHCS. This is a lot to lift up um, on a very aggressive time frame, though, exactly to your point, Gladys, on our families, our people, they need it. At the end of the day, none of this probably means a hoopla to them, but it does to us. And we're the ones responsible for making sure that these services happen, you know, but at a level that they deserve to, to fidelity and, and helping bring that to the system also. Oops, that wasn't short, but I'm gonna stop now. Okay. Give me the hook. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I, um, I can follow up on that because I do appreciate the, the question ar around accountability, particularly around some of the public comments that really spoke to this vision of the commission as holding responsibility for that accountability, right? So I just, um, the pressure is on for all of us. Mm -hmm. And one lever that if we really wanna hold ourselves to is do people, when they're asked, could you navigate the system well, and they answer yes, which ordinarily you don't hear that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a challenge for everyone, regardless of income, regardless of background, right? So that's an aside. Um, but I had specific questions. First on early intervention, I just really want to say thanks for emphasizing this point around without diagnosis, mm -hmm. right, to really uplift that we want to prevent uh, crisis around our young people and, and, do, and ensure that these dollars are going towards that. And I see that in particular with great alignment with so many of the historic reforms that the department is doing, at DHCS also, mm -hmm. with CalAIM and improving Medi-Cal and strengthening it for people. All of that goes hand in hand, and that effort has really emphasized the without diagnosis piece. So to be hand in hand with this effort is just so important. So I really want to commend you for emphasizing that point. It was heard, at least great. for those of us that were listening for it. Um, and at the same time, through CalAIM and many of those initiatives, it's been clear that there are challenges with building the capacity of community organizations mm -hmm. to build Medi-Cal or to understand um, how the certification works. And so uh, just thinking the lessons learned from CalAIM mm -hmm. and how that can apply here is really important. And most imp and relevant is where the commission serves as a partner in mm -hmm. that. Given that we're such a, where you are this open door is there an opportunity to be collaborative? Mm -hmm. And I, I wanna draw attention to the commission staff. Like I wouldn't have known about that RFA, RFP for the BHCIP, mm -hmm. it's not on our website. A lot of people don't go to DHCS for mental health information, they're going to the Mental Health Commission. And where is there opportunity for cross posting, cross messaging, right? Like sure. so that where our stakeholders are all hearing the same message from DHCS because to, to the public, it's the government, it's the yeah. state. It doesn't matter what the agency is and we should be consistent. So um, for, for our commission staff, how can we be um, a megaphone of what DHCS is doing? Again, because we are that door to so many people. Um, and then I, had a, I do have a question around CDEP or, or a comment to take back because I know we're cutting short on time is, I, I think we talked about this a lot with the CLCC and this constantly comes up around CDEPs and the importance of CDEPs and building the literature base for CDEPs. Um, but one, one thing where I'm, I'm getting a bit confused, Marlies, is mm -hmm. this, are we talking about specific programs or are we talking about approaches, right? And it sounds like you're talking about programs, like here are programs that we have in California, which is one important thing to do because there are great programs throughout the state that are run by our community leaders. But are we holding ourselves short mm. if we're only talking about programs and not approaches? And mm -hmm. I can give you a specific example um, the Village Project mm -hmm. in Northern California talks about African-American education and literature and learning the history and how that is a positive intervention for youth mental health development, right? Um, does it have to be the Village Project or mm -hmm. can we emphasize the approach mm -hmm. of cultural history and education mm -hmm. to build racial, positive racial identity? So just something to think about. This is, and how, again, the commission can be your partner in emphasizing that narrative around CDEPs, not um, the more general one. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last, uh, and then switching to FSPs, 
this, you had a specific slide around FSPs and young people. And at our last commission meeting, we had an extensive conversation around FSPs that was super helpful around the history. But one of the um, pieces that was highlighted from the OAC's own analysis is that more than half of FSPs are actually focused on children and young people. Mm -hmm. And so as we switch the rules or change the approaches, there's some risk that it's not then going to emphasize young people. And so just wanted to keep in mind that when we know half of them are going towards the support of young people, um, how can we make sure with these changes we're not doing da unintentional, unintentional damage or unintended consequences for that? Um, yeah. So thanks so much. Sure. I do just, I want to just state really clearly though, um, we wouldn't, we have no intention of damaging any FSP models already in place for youth and that, that's not it at all. It's those models um, that we talked about, like with the levels of care for, you know, those need to be in place for adults and then the high fidelity wrap needs to be in place for kids, that, but that doesn't preclude counties from doing the effective models run FSP for young people that they're already doing. So I do just want to state that. And then I'm going to call out on Tom Oreck. I'm going to make him embarrassed here for a second, <laughs> but I cannot thank him enough for his collaboration over the last few weeks and even getting me before you. I've been a pain because I'm like, I got to get to the commission. I want to bring this forward. I want them to hear what's going on. And he made that happen. And he's been an incredible partner and with the team as well. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, and to thank him and to apologize publicly um, that I was such a pest, but because I wanted to bring this for your feedback and to get you, you know, just seeing what we're doing at the department because it's moving so quickly, but recognize this is, you know, we'll, we'll come back again as invited and, you know, we can continue these discussions. Okay, can just one last quick question? I know quick we're question. short time. Go ahead, D please. Data, what are you doing to integrate data so we can measure results across the system? He asks like the largest question that would yeah, take and eight just years to High get level, 30, you know, not deep, yes. just fast. <laughs> yeah, we so we are looking more. at our current data systems and seeing what we need to do to really get the level of data that we need for the performance measures, especially we're going to have different phases of these rolling out. Um, but there's going to be an extensive amount of work being done in that space. Well, I think that would be a great point of collaboration with the commission because we have a lot of efforts in that area. Awesome. Great. Great. Thank you. Great. We're going to go ahead and move on to public comment at this time. Thank you so much, Marlise. We appreciate it. At this time, the public may request to make public comment on this agenda item by clicking the raise hand button on your computer or the app or calling in by phone and push star nine. Once the public comment period for this agenda item starts, we will close the public comment queue. So please make your request to comment now. Also, please limit your comments to three minutes or less. Amadiani, are there any public comments? Please raise your hand now as the queue will be closing. We have uh, one in-room public comment and three virtual. Our first in-room comment is from Stacy. Stacey Hiramoto, REMCO, the Racial and Ethnic Mental Health Disparities Coalition. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't realize she had to leave. I mean, I think it is funny because the thing that I wanted to comment about publicly and let you know um, is that as a member of the public, it's been hard for me to follow what DHCS is doing with early intervention. Now, I want to say some good news. I mean, the fact that there is some room about the diagnosis uh, question and whether you need to have one is good because currently in, in PEI regs you have to have a diagnosis or be very close to having a diagnosis to be considered early intervention. Why does this matter? Because m many, many, maybe even more than 50% of the CDIPs do not require you to say or have a diagnosis. And yet they serve folks in this category alongside of people in prevention. So how is this going to get funding? And maybe it'll get funded at the local level, but the folks that I represent, they're really trying to figure this out. And unlike the OAC that had a fabulous public comment process. I want to thank Jigna and Tom and any of the other staff that are uh, responsible for that where there was a lot of interaction. 
um, it was very open. The uh, sessions that DHCS has had, I and I consider myself fairly well informed, but I was like, because they're calling it behavioral health transformation, not Prop One. So a lot of us weren't, you know, cued in. And at these, you cannot sign up for a, to be on a list to get the notices for these. You literally have to go to the website and keep checking to see when the next meeting is. <laughs> That's kind of hard. And I, I, again, I, I consider myself fairly plugged in, and I, I, I've been like buried. Um, also, they've formed um, a, a committee. Anyway, I'm not going to go into that. Uh, so I've talked about the CDEPs, and again, want to commend the, the OAC, but the process that is being used for public comment is very old, old school, where the public gets to speak at the very end for ten, you know. They, they allot 10 minutes at the very end, and you know, people can speak for like one minute. I don't consider that, you know, very robust public uh, engagement. So anyway, I, again, I want to thank the OAC for doing that, and I wish that this information could be, I mean, I, mean, I really miss the days when more families and consumers and people from the community w were engaged. So thank you. Thank you, Stacy. Our next public comment is from Merritt. Your line is open. Thank you. I'm uh, Dr. Merritt Schreiber. I'm a clinical child psychologist on the faculty at Harbor UCLA Medical Center, our Lundquist Institute, and the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. I'm fortunate to be funded by a couple of efforts from um, the state of California. One is through CYBHI. And it is a uh, training of uh, TFCBT by telehealth for kids uh, who are exposed to community violence or family violence and have an injury that results in them being transported to either UC Davis Children's Hospital or UC San Francisco Benioff Children's Hospital. Um, so I'm in very, very heartened to hear the presentation by D DHCS to hear about the uh, focus on early risk identification, even pre-diagnosis. We have um, a federal effort to improve uh, response to kids in disasters and other kinds of acute trauma, like motor vehicle accidents, active uh, shooter situations, uh, climate-related, uh, you know, excessive heat plus wildfires, of course, our state is, uh, you know, unfortunately really prone to. We'd like to have a lot more engagement. We have a learning collaborative model, a breakthrough series that involves triage to step care. So identification of risk of uh, kids and youth without using symptoms, without using diagnostic categories, based solely on what happened to them, their exposure and their losses. Does it require mental health professionals? We've piloted this through SAMHSA funding in Sonoma County with Sonoma County Office of Ed. I think we actually had some commissioners present at a showcase of that uh, earlier this year at Sonoma County High School. And basically it's early risk identification and rapid linkage even before uh, clinical disorder and things like school impairment can set in. So we would definitely like to partner uh, further with DHCS and other components of the state to uh, make sure that triage to care is a one piece of this larger early risk uh, intervention. The other thing we've been funded through California Department of Ed, through <laughs> County Department of Ed, and then Sonoma County Office of Ed is a a uh, triage system that parents can access voluntarily, indicating what's happened to their kids via their schools. That's now available at no cost to any school district in California. We've not had a lot of uptake. I don't think it's uh, very well known, but it's definitely out there. And, you know, we're eager to bridge, for example, the CYBHI TFCBT as one of the CDEPs uh, to make essentially a virtual response capability across the state so that even smaller areas, smaller Sierra Thank you, Mary. Your time is up. Please wrap up your comment. Yeah. 
I was just to say there's some other ideas to build uh, virtual telehealth capability so that uh, underserved communities and areas could also access uh, EBTs. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Schreiber. Um, I will have staff reach out for that resource. Um, Tom, you can take note, please. Great, thank you. Thank you. Next, we have a public comment from the phone number ending in 319. Your line is unmuted. Hello, commissioners. This is Steve Leone. Uh, for those of you who remember me, um, I'm not entirely- Steve? Ready. Yes? Steve? We can hardly hear you. It you sound like you're really far away. So I don't know if you can do something with your volume. Uh, do you want to go ahead and try again? I think we tried to do something on our end. Can you hear me now? Yes, can you hear me now? Um no, it's still really muffled. I don't understand. Okay, we got you. Yep, we can hear you now, Steve. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. I'm trying to figure out what was wrong. For those of you who remember me, I'm not in good health, uh, so that's why I'm not here in person. But I do want to speak about the full issue. I've been actually despairing for this entire process because I'm very concerned about the fact that over the years, full service partnerships have been drifting. And what they're, what's being done in many counties is not what the original model is. The governor has seen is actually fill in the blank gap with things that are not part of the original full service partnership and run contrary to them. I mean, a lot of people don't know, it was founded on something called the village in Long Beach, different from the village that's out there now. And it was 10 years, eight hundred legislation by Kathy Wright, AB3777. And they spent those 10 years using evidence-based ideas, not evidence-based ideas, but creating evidence in their process. And we weren't using fidelity and evidence in the state that much at that time. But we believe that those things put together by Mark Reagan and Dave Pallon, whom you did hear from yourself, uh, were not carried forward. And they're not considered evidence-based. They're not even a seed of some kind. Um, and so, you know, the, the model, number one, is not just that, which the governor says it is. It, it goes to the clubhouse model as well and the recovery model and to fidelity. But the fidelity doesn't include what was created originally in the original village. And furthermore, there's a very damaging statement that in the step down, uh, it's based on acuity. And acuity, say what's wrong with that? Acuity means like your symptoms going away or getting better. They can step down. In the original FSP, it was more something called, um, you know, your recovery staff has a, a document called the Milestones of Recovery. And they didn't step people down until they were self-sustaining to some extent with self-management. It wasn't just your symptoms are better, so we took you down. And it was a clubhouse model, like I say, which is an active, community-based issue as opposed to a case management model, no matter how intense or elaborate. And I think there's a lot being lost here. And I want to make a final statement on this, but I was listening with great interest when she talked about the um, children's wraparound, intensive wraparound, and that they don't define levels in that flexibility. And I'm thinking, why can't we have that flexibility on the adult side, not just on the children's side? Because that flexibility was the heart of the MHSA. And that model, uh, the village model, so called from Long Beach, actually was recognized at the national level, you know, like 10 years, 20 years ago. And, and I mean, I'm just saying that we're losing something precious here and must be very careful. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Our next public comment is from Jasmine. Your line is open. 
Good morning, commissioners. My name is Hasmina Seves Rosas, and I am a policy associate with the Children's Partnership, a statewide children's health equity organization. The Children's Partnership would first like to thank DHCS for including children's advocates in the dialogue about Prop 1 implementation. We are grateful for having been a part of uplifting the state's opportunity to ensure children and youth are kept whole during this behavioral health transformation effort. In particular, we would like to reiterate the importance of state guidance, making explicit that county early intervention services are inclusive of, though not limited to, services that intervene early in the life course, and not only early in the disease or illness course, as a way to prevent mental illness from ever developing in children and youth. Thank you to Marlies for noting in her presentation that diagnosis is not necessary for children and youth to receive early intervention services. We know children of color and low-income children are the populations that are at most risk and have the least resources to access diagnostic tools and services. And as such, we are grateful to the governor for his inclusion of language in Proposition 1 that makes clear children and youth who do not have a diagnosis but nevertheless have unmet mental health needs due to trauma or whose communities have experienced historic disparities in access and positive mental health outcomes are indeed eligible for early intervention services under the BHSA. We ask that the department in its policy manual make this explicit to counties who in the past have had a much narrower understanding of who is eligible for early intervention services. Finally, we also want to encourage the commission to collaborate closely with the department in its BHSA policy manual. Given the commission's history in an oversight and accountability role and the challenges communities have had in participating in county MHSA decisions, accessing disaggregated service and outcome data, and holding their county leaders accountable to regulatory and statutory requirements for minimum spending on children and youth. Thank you. Thank you, Jasmine. And that was our last public comment. Thank you, Amariani. We are now moving to agenda item six, closed session. Before we move to closed session, members of the public may request to make a public comment on this item by clicking the raised hand button on your computer or the app, or if calling in by phone, push star nine. Once a public comment period for this agenda item starts, we will close the public comment queue. So please make your request to comment now. Also, please limit your comments to three minutes or less. Amadiani, are there any public comments? Please raise your hand now as the queue will be closing. I do not see any public comments. Thank you. So we are... We have one public comment in the room. Okay, so go ahead. Uh, we have Stacy. I, I don't want you, this is Stacy Hiramoto, Remco, the Racial and Ethnic Mental Health Disparities Coalition. I don't want you to think that there are no public comments because they do not have opinions on this. I think it was not noted in the program, and then I, we actually called and we were told we, were, we would not be able to give public comment except during the beginning public comment period. So I just wanted to say that, that again, it was not noted in the program. So people aren't prepared, but believe me, they have things to say. Thank you, Stacy. Um, we actually did just receive one virtual comment. Uh, we have Andrea, your line is open. Hi, uh, I don't know if you can hear me. Andrea, we can't hear you. Yes, go ahead. Sorry, I'm in um, Thank you very much. Um, I really want to just say out loud what I what I sent in an email. Um, I wasn't able to uh, provide public comment earlier this morning, um, but that is to just share the fact that, um, as as Stacy pointed out earlier, there have been staff at the commission who have been um, unhappy and. Um, you know, feeling like they're working in a hostile work environment and are, you know, significantly affected in terms of their mental health um, by the environment of the commission uh, under Toby's leadership. And as you know, uh, my brother was the chief counsel for the commission uh, for a year and a half until his uh, sudden uh, death from a massive heart attack. And, um, 
you know, I'm not trying to say that the stress at work was the single and only cause of that heart attack. Of course, that's not the case, but it was one of several contributing factors, and it certainly did not help. And, you know, I can't help but, but to say out loud, because it's true, it's possible, maybe not likely, but it is possible that he might be alive today had that not been the case. And the stress resulted from the fact that Toby did not like uh, his efforts to try to make sure that, that Toby was operating, uh, you know, completely within the law and that what was happening at the commission was, um, was what the state could be proud of and not embarrassed by. Um, and, you know, that's what we fought for in the legislature to get out of Prop 1, the proposal to move the commission under agency because we believed in, in its value and its independence. And now it's independent, and, and as a result, its independence is now sort of coming back to bite us because we have no way to hold Toby accountable. He has done fantastic work there, and that's the saddest part is because it, it doesn't matter. You can't, you can't allow him to continue to work there and hurt people. Um, you know, maybe his talents can be used elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. And we had one more public comment from Susan. Your line's open. Yes, I just want to, um, again, this is Susan Gallagher with Cal Voices, Executive Director. Um, I wanted to ask if there's going to be any kind of report back from the commission. Um, I know there is an investigation, and perhaps it's out in the public eye, but I certainly haven't seen the, a copy of that report. Um, I don't know if that will be shared with the public. I know there are some personnel matters and things of, of, of that nature that you guys have to protect and preserve in terms of employment records and things like that. But I think it's really important for the public to know what the results are and that there be some sense of transparency around this. And so I feel like the commission has a role to play in that. And honestly, these sole source contracts and all this stuff has been going on forever. Toby's been running around the Capitol forever, doing his thing, asking, having his own agenda. I mean, we have asked as peer-run organizations forever for him to focus on some of our issues. And we have never been able to get him to focus on it. And yet, it, it's like he's a lobbyist. I don't think that's the role of the executive commission or um, executive director of the commission. So I, you know... Um, we all stay here and we do this at risk. We come and we testify here at risk and, and none of us should have to go through that. Never mind the staff, the community. We've all been bullied in some way or another by Toby. I mean, he personally told me if I kept coming to the um, meetings and testifying against his policies that he would take our funding and that's exactly what he did. Um, I just, you know, we work in a mental health system. We're supposed to preserve people's mental health, create psychological safety. You guys are role models. You're role models for the community. You're role models for the system. And I really hope that you show some leadership. We we're really, really disappointed when you guys did not oppose 326. Um, and this whole Prop 1 that is changing everything and all of this shift of taxpayer money towards hedge funds and what have you, because all these treatment facilities are owned by places like that. Community-based orgs are going out of business. We're never going to get this back. And you guys have a responsibility. And it's not some fun game about going on trips with people and rubbing elbows with people of stature. So I really hope that the commission does the right thing today. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Susan. Um, and our last comment is from Renee. Your line is open. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for taking my comments. I come to you today as the former Director of Research and Evaluation at the Commission. I was hired in 2012 and then uh, left voluntarily nine years ago, specifically because I was subjected to bullying, intimidation, harassment, and threats routinely by Toby Unit Ewing. I also personally witnessed Toby attacking my research scientist staff and bullying them based on their mental health illnesses and challenges, which is very, very sad to see, but it's even sadder to see nine years have passed and nothing has been done about this. 
I personally reached out to every single commissioner who was on the commission at that time nine years ago, and they turned a blind eye and did not do anything. I'm here to please encourage you all to do the right thing and, to and terminate Toby's employment. He is not, he does not behave in a matter that's appropriate for a state representative or to lead the charges of the Behavioral Health or the Mental Health Services Oversight and Accountability Commission. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. That, <clears throat> that was our last public yeah. comment. In accordance with Government Code Section 11126, the Commission will now move to closed session to discuss a personnel matter. For commissioners joining us virtually, you should have received a second different link to join the closed session portion of the meeting. Please exit the current meeting and join the second closed session meeting. For members of the public, we will return at approximately 1.30 for a report back. If our return time changes, we will update the slide on Zoom with an approximate return time. Thank you. All right, good afternoon. I just wanted to provide a, an update. The Commission will continue meeting in closed session, and it is unlikely that we will return in time to consider the rem remainder agenda items. However, we will provide another update later on. The plan is to table the remaining agenda items to November, but we will provide one more update, so just wanted to let you know that. The goal is to return to public session approximately 3 o'clock, uh, but we will I just said that three times, <laughs> periodically provide updates. So thank you. Uh, we will be back. OK. Welcome back, everyone. The commissioners have been in closed session and will now report on actions that took place during the closed session. The commission has accepted the executive director's resignation effective November 22nd. So that now concludes today's meeting. I want to thank you all for participating and engaging in today's meeting. We look forward to seeing you all at the November meeting where we will conclude the business that was not done today, including elections. And I just wanted to note, I will not be here at November's meeting. And I'm very sad about that because I wanted to raise the nominations, but we're going to try to make that work out. And so. Um, we will see you next month. Thank you for being here. Um, we'll see you next month. Bye-bye.